Hi, this is Mr. Lemansky, and this is section 1.3, which is writing expressions. Uh, writing expressions is an important skill, especially going forward in algebra, because as you get into solving word problems, if you're good at writing expressions, it's going to make it easy for you to be good at solving these word and story problems. If you struggle writing expressions, it's going to make solving story problems that much tougher too. Okay? So writing expressions is a skill that I know you have practiced at some level in 7th and 8th grade, but it's something that we want to continue to practice and actually try to master more here at, at the algebra level in ninth grade. All right? So here's what writing an expression means. It means translating a verbal phrase into an algebraic expression. So, okay, so what do you mean by translating a verbal phrase into an algebraic expression? It could be something as simple as, like, I'm looking on page 15, if you have your book open, page 15. Something like, if you look at example one, it says, 4 less than the quantity 6 times a number n. That's a verbal phrase. Well, when you rewrite it in L as an algebraic expression, it's simply 6n minus 4. That would be taking a verbal phrase and writing it into an algebraic expression. So in order to do that, we need to know what certain words mean. Okay? Here are some words that tell us that we are adding, or it means addition. When you're reading a verbal phrase and you see the word sum, or plus, total, more than, increased by, any of those words or phrases tell us that that verbal phrase is indicating that we are adding. Okay. Here are some words that indicate subtraction. Difference, less than, minus, decreased by. Okay. Now there's a one main important difference that we really have to be good at if we're going to be effective at writing algebraic expressions. Okay. Major difference between an addition and subtraction. In addition, the order doesn't matter. I can write my phrase out in any way I want to. Order is not important. But when you subtract, order is important. Like, for example, the difference of n and 6. When, it, when you hear the difference, difference means subtracting, the difference of n and 6, that would mean n minus 6. It does not mean 6 minus n. When you subtract, the order matters. Now, if you're wondering, well, if you're thinking, why does it matter? I'm not getting it, okay? Well, let me just pick something easy that I know you would get. Let's take something simple like 5 minus 2. I, un I, I completely know as a teacher that you all know what 5 minus 2 is. You all know it's 3. But now think for a minute. If I switch the order around and put 2 minus 5, do I get the same thing? And I also know you know this answer. No, it isn't the same. You get negative 3. The order when you subtract matters. If you switch it, you've just switched the entire problem, or you, you're not getting the same result. So when you read these verbal phrases, when you write them out, when they involve subtraction, you've got to write it in the proper order, or it doesn't mean the right thing. So when you subtract, order matters. Multiplication. Here are some words that mean multiplication or indicate when you read, and we're trying to write these as algebraic expressions, that you need to have multiplication, like times. Product means multiplication. Obviously, multiplied by would mean multiplication. When you see the word of, let me turn this layer on, when you see the word of, that means multiplication when we are working with percents. Double, triple, quadruple. Those mean multiplication. You might be like, well, how does double mean multiplication? Well, think about it. Doesn't double mean two times as much? You know, doubling means times two. Tripling means three times as much. That means times three. Quadrupling means four times as much, and so on. Those are words that mean multiplication. And let me erase those out of there because I just don't want to make it hard to read. What, what words here mean division? Quotient. Quotient is what you, the answer you get when you divide. Divided by obviously means division. Divided into means division. Now again, there's a major difference between multiplication and division. When dividing, the order matters. 
Like if you had the phrase, the quotient of K and 2, now quotient means divide, so they're asking us to divide K and 2. Dividing K and 2 means K divided by 2. It does not mean 2 divided by K. 3 divided into N. That means I'm dividing N into 3 parts. I'm dividing 3 into it. That means n divided by 3, or n over 3. It does not mean 3 divided by n. The order matters. Again, here would be a simple example of why the order matters. Uh, take something simple like 12 divided by 3. I think everyone watching this knows right now that 12 divided by 3, even without a calculator, 12 divided by 3 is 4. But if you do 3 divided by 12, you don't get 4. You get a quarter. You do not get the same thing when you rearrange the order. So that order for division definitely matters. In multiplication, the order doesn't matter. Think about it. 3 times 5 is 15. 5 times 3 still gives you 15. Order doesn't matter when you multiply. Okay, so what they're going to have you practicing in the homework is they're going to have you practicing, first of all, just be, being able to take a verbal expression or a verbal phrase and write it as an algebraic expression. Like in number four, it says the product. Now think about what does product mean? The product of six and a number y. Well, product is multiply. They want me multiplying six and y. So I would recommend writing six y. I guess if you want to put the y first, you do have to put a dot to represent multiplication, y times 6. Do not write y6. Okay, that is not an accepted form of that. If I see you writing that, I will take off some points. Okay, we would never write y6. 6y is understood to mean 6 times y. y6 is awkward. You will not see anybody write it that way, in a book anyway. And it can be confused, does this mean y times 6, or is it y to the 6th power? So if you insist on putting the y first, you've got to put a dot in between. That's why I'm saying just writing 6y would be the best way to write that. Or if you look at number 10, it says 3 less than the square of a number p. Okay, 3 less than. Less than is subtracting. 3 less than the square of a number 3. So I want to take away 3 away from p squared. So uh, that would look like this. Now sometimes people struggle. They're like, what, how did you know how to put it in that order? What I would suggest doing, if you struggle at all, is let's get rid of the abstract portion of the problem. Like some people are probably like right now listening to this and, and looking at number 10 and like, I don't know what p squared means. Okay, I'm the teacher and I don't know what it means either. Okay. So if you're struggling with the order, let's forget about p squared. Let's just pretend that p squared was 10. Let's reread number 10, and let's just pretend that p squared was 10. Let's read this together. Ready? What if I said 3 less than the number 10? Now think in your head for a minute. 3 less than the number 10. What number is 3 less than the number 10? And you're probably thinking, what is 3 less than the number 10? You're probably coming up with 7 right now, and you'd be right. Okay, now, how do you get 7? Do you take 3 minus 10 to get 7, or you do 10 minus 3? Well, of course, you're going to do 10 minus 3, okay? So I know that since it's 10 minus 3, when I say 3 less than the square of a number p squared, it's got to be p squared minus 3. I know the minus 3 has to come after. So whenever I get stuck on these... If the problem is abstract or the phrase is abstract, and I'm like, man, I have a hard time wrapping my mind with this P squared thing. Well, forget about P squared. Just pick any number, 20. 3 less than 20. Well, I know 3 less than 20 is 17. Well, how do I get that? Do I do 20 minus 3 or 3 minus 20? I do 20 minus 3. That tells me, in this case, I better do P squared minus 3. That's the proper order. Okay? A verbal model is when you have a real-life situation and you write an algebraic expression for it, like in questions 15 to 25. Like here would be an example of number 15. They want us to write a verbal model for number 15. It says, the number of tokens needed for V video games if each game takes four tokens. Now, some of you 
might be like, I already know it, it's 4V. And if you know it's 4V, you're right. Okay, that is the verbal, that is the uh, algebraic expression for that verbal model. However, I'm sure there's some of you that are probably thinking, what? How did you get that? Okay, if you're, if it's too abstract and you're there, if you're like, man, I don't get that. Okay, this is what I would recommend you do. Okay, let's read this again, but let's put in a simple number for V. Ready? I'm just going to read this. We're going to say V is 2 because I know you'll get this. The number of tokens needed for two video games if each game takes four tokens. So think, you want to play two video games, and each time you play, it's four tokens. So if I want to play two games, and each time I play, it's four tokens, most of you have probably come up with, well, I'm going to need eight tokens. Well, how did you get eight? What math did you do to get eight? You're probably starting to think, what did I do? Two games, I need four tokens for each one. I did two times four. Can you see that here? Instead of V, you did two times four. Two times four is eight. Or what about this for number 15? The number of tokens needed for five video games if each game takes four tokens. So let's think for a minute, because if we get rid of the abstractness and you actually put a number, it's easier to wrap your mind around. I want to play five video games, and every time I play, it takes four tokens. So if I want to play five games, and each time I play, it takes four tokens, well, I'm going to need 20 tokens. How did I get 20? Well, I did, let me see, five games, four tokens each, five times four. Five times four is 20. So there's your pattern. Take the number of games you're going to play and multiply by 4. Well, that's what this is. V games times 4 tokens. There's your pattern. Um, take a look at 19. The number of days left in the week if D days have passed. So some of you might already know the answer, and some of you might be like, what? I don't know what to do. Well, let's think for a minute. If you don't know what to do, forget about D, and let's pick something. Let's pick an easy number of days. The number of days left in the week if, we'll say, two days have passed. So if you have a week, how many days are in a week? Think about that. Um, let's see, there's seven days a week. And two days have passed. So if there's seven days in the week and two days have passed, how many days are left? You're probably easily coming up with, well, seven minus two is five. Well, there's your pattern. You take seven days in the week minus the number of days that have passed, there's your expression. So this would work out to 7 minus D. If, if there was three days that have passed, 7 minus 3, there's four days left in the week. So any time I get stuck on those, and I'm not going to lie to you, I'm the, man, I'm the teacher, and there's times that i got to stop and think. If I ever have to stop and think because I'm not sure, I just take the variable out of the problem, and I pick something easy and try to think through the problem with an easy number in there. Once I find the pattern, like here the pattern was just take seven days minus the number of days that have passed. Now I can replace that variable back in. There is my algebraic expression. And, boy, this is terrible on my part. I just noticed that I'm not writing. I'm not spelling very good here, am I? There we go. Let me correct that. For any parent out there watching that and seeing that I'm spelling algebraic with I and, and A reverse, they might get on my case. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch that and get that right. Okay? Um, let's talk about two more things, and then we're going to be done with this video. Um, top of page 17, they're also going to have us practice because in verbal models, we will use the um, we will use the terms rate and unit rate. Well, we got to know what those are. What is a rate? A rate is when you are comparing two quantities in a fraction. So you might be looking at that and, okay, what do you mean? Well, you do it all the time, and I don't even think you realize it. Like, here would be an easy rate. Like, a hundred. let's say you travel 120 miles in three hours. Do you see how we compared two quantities, 120 miles in three hours in a fraction? Or, I pick Matt Stafford, I think we all... Most of us like Matt Stafford, and the Lions had a good year last year, and we're excited about this year. Let's say Matt Stafford, I hope this happens, that he throws 15 touchdown passes in three games. That's a rate. 
15 touchdown passes in three games. That is a quantity, in, two quantities in a fraction. That's called a rate. Now, when you have a unit rate, a unit rate is the same idea as up here, except we're not looking at, like, how many miles in three hours and how many TD passes in three games. We're looking at how many do we have per one, per hour, per game. That's what a unit rate. Unit means per one. Okay. Normally, when we think about miles per hour, we don't think about how many miles we can go in three hours. We think about how many miles can we go in an hour. Or think about sports. We don't normally think of how many touchdown passes per three games. We would think how many touchdown passes per game. Okay. Or in football, how many yards rush per, per play. Or in basketball, how many points per game. Okay. It's always per one. So that's easy to figure out the unit rates for these. You just have to divide. So the unit rate in my first little example, if you travel 120 miles in three hours, 120 divided by three is 40. That would be the equivalent of 40 miles per one hour. I should turn that layer on so I can write a one in there. Okay, 40 miles per hour, one hour. Or Matt Stafford, if he could actually throw, I hope it happens, 15 touchdown passes in three games. Well, that would be the equivalent of throwing five touchdown passes per game. Those would be now unit rates. We found out what, what were these quantities per one hour or per one game. That's called a unit rate. And you'll notice in the homework they will ask you to um, find unit rates in some of these questions, like in number 22, they asked for us to find the unit rate. Well, if they gave us 32 students and they broke it, those students into four groups, I want to find the unit rate. I want to find out how many students per one group. Well, that's easy to do. 32 divided by 4 is 8. That's the equivalent of 8 students per one group. Okay? Um, I think that should get you started on what we are doing in this section, all right? If you have questions, again, starting off class tomorrow, uh, please bring those to my attention, and we'll immediately attack the questions that you had over the video or what questions you see you might have in the homework, all right? And that's the end of this video.